morning, Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I am James Botting, Washington. Today is Tuesday, February 7th, and here are some of the stories we are covering. Demonstrators in DRC protest the East African Community Force. Protester John Sengo says that Kenyan forces must go. He says the protests will continue for at least 10 days or longer until they leave. The UN South Sudan mission welcomes deployment of forces to Kojikaji County following killings there. Eswatini government says no dialogue with pro-democracy groups amid violence and murders. Announcement is made in investing in African mining. Liberia calls for $1 billion to reduce carbon emissions and reserve its forests. We are asking the international community to begin in the next several months ahead to think about creating a pool fund up to a billion dollars so we can be able to leverage our carbon stock. And the death toll continues to rise from the magnitude 7.8 earthquake in Turkey. Those stories and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. Socioeconomic activities were paralyzed Monday in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo city of Goma. The demonstrators were objecting to the advance of M23 rebels and what they called the ineffectiveness of the East African Community EAC forces and UN peacekeepers in the region. Reporter Zaneb Neti Zaide has the story. The demonstrators demanded that the regional forces of the East African community and Monisco peacekeepers that are fighting alongside regular forces, the rebels, to leave the country. Oh. Protester John Sengo says that Kenyan forces must go. He says the protests will continue for at least 10 days or longer until they leave. Protester Bahati Lumo believes that the East African Community Force has been incompetent and is making no effort to stop the advance of the Tutibaket M23 rebels. He says the EAC forces are not only failing to stop the group but may even be encouraging the enemy's advance. He says the government needs to be much more responsible by proving adequate support for the Congolese army and not relying on foreign forces. The demonstration also targeted some establishment and people suspected of playing into the hands of the enemy, stores, churches and some businesses owned by Rwandans were vandalized which some citizen activists deplore. As Parwinuka and activists with the human rights group Lucha warns that attacking people's property is not a good thing to do. In fact, it can promote ethnic hatred which can cause many consequences. By late afternoon, an apparent calm was visible on some stretches of road. Police and some residents walked to clear barricades and keep traffic flowing. For VOA Africa, Amzane Mnetizaidi in Goma. The government of Eswatini says it has always been interested in holding a national dialogue with the country's pro-democracy groups. But spokesperson Alfias Zumalo says no dialogue can take place amid violence and murder that have rocked the country in the last year. Last week, leaders of the Southern African Development Community Troika Organ on Politics, Defense and Security called on Eswatini to urgently initiate a process of national dialogue with pro-democracy groups. The leaders also called for a swift, transparent, and comprehensive investigation into the killing of human rights lawyer Tulani Maseko. The pro-democracy groups say they want an independent body to conduct the probe because they do not trust the government. Government spokesperson Zimalo tells me Eswatini is a sovereign state and can do its own investigations. The position of the government of the kingdom of Eswatini, the position of the Sada Troika is the same. There is a need for a Maswati to hold a national dialogue. But the national dialogue has been held by violence which started in 2021. And there is absolutely no possibility of holding a national dialogue under a violent situation of circumstance where members of the public, some of them are shot 
for wearing traditional attire and attending traditional ceremonies where members of the security forces are shot at random. The opposition or the pro-democracy people might say it is your government that does not want to go to dialogue and talking about the violence, they would say that the assassination of uh, Tulani and uh, other people, the violence is being initiated by your government. That would be an incorrect assertion. The government has never initiated any form, shape of violence. Neither did the government assassinate Tulani Maseko. The position remains the same. Government is ready. Government was ready a long time ago to hold a national dialogue. But the intimidation that was unleashed by these terrorists who are sponsored by foreign forces created an atmosphere in the country and environment that was and still remains not conducive to hold a national dialogue. Another thing coming out of the Vinghol Summit is the call by SADC for your government to investigate or launch a transparent and comprehensive investigation into the assassination of Tulani Maseko. The last time we spoke, you said that an investigation was underway. The opposition, at least those I have spoken with, say they don't trust your government to conduct a transparent investigation. They would like for an international body to conduct such investigation. That is exactly where the problem is. To trust or not to trust is a choice. We are a sovereign state. We have got laws that we follow in this country. There is absolutely no need for a myopic position in terms of these investigations. The investigations shall be done according to the law, and the investigations shall be impartial, shall be transparent, and in due course, when there are results of the investigation, they shall be communicated openly. Everybody will know what happened. To us, it is only when and then the international community, after they have interrogated the investigation of our security organs, that they can make a comment, they can suggest certain interventions, then we will take it from there. Alfie Zamalo is the Eswatin government spokesperson. He was speaking with me from the capital, Mbabani. A Kenyan court has rejected an effort by Meta, the parent company of Facebook, to stop a case accusing it of exploitation and poor working conditions. Meta argued that the Employment and Labor Relations Court did not have jurisdiction in the case since it is not based in or does not trade in Kenya. The French news agency AFP says the suit was filed by a former content moderator, Asama, a company contracted by Meta to review Facebook posts. The case alleges that workers in Kenya were subjected to inhumane conditions, including forced labor, irregular pay, and no right to form a union. It also alleges that moderators were exposed to gruesome content, including torture, with no regard to their mental health. But the High Court Judge Jacob Gakira ruled that two meta platforms being sued were proper parties. The court is due to meet on March 8 to discuss how to proceed to a hearing. You are listening to Daybreak Africa on the Voices of America. I am James Barton, Washington. Today is Tuesday, February 7th. For more Africa news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The United Nations mission in South Sudan has welcomed the deployment of government forces to Kajokeji County after last week's deadly intercommunal violence. The attacks claimed the lives of at least 27 people. Deng Gai Deng reports for VOA from Juba. The UN mission in South Sudan was shocked to receive initial reports of the deadly violence in Kajokeji County in central Equatoria state that claimed the lives of at least 27 people and left many others injured on the 2nd of February. That's Unimis spokesperson Linda Tom is speaking in pre-recorded audio sent to South Sudan in focus. Nicholas Asom, the UN Secretary General's special representative in South Sudan and Unimis chief called their violence unacceptable. The same day, Pope Francis wrapped up his visit to the country, which was dubbed a pilgrimage of peace. 
SMH South Sudanese authorities to heed the Pope's message, investigate the killings and hold the perpetrators accountable. Tom says at least 2,000 people, mainly women and children, have become internally displaced, including 30 unaccompanied children following the violence. She says UNIMIS is gravely concerned about the resurgence of killings and violence stemming from long-standing tensions between cattle keepers and host communities in central Ikatora State and in other parts of the country. Central Ikatora State Information Minister Andruga Mabe told reporters Friday Governor Emmanuel Adilt held a State Council of Ministers meeting over the Kaujokeji attacks and dispatched security forces to the area. Tom commend the government for taking action to protect civilians in Kajokeji. The mission further welcomes the government's deployment of troops to the area to quell tensions and protect internally displaced persons. UNMIS is increasing patrols to the affected areas and engaging the authorities as well as community leaders to bring an end to these hostilities and seek peaceful solutions. Over the past two weeks, Tom says the UN has recorded at least 45 deaths among unarmed civilians in Kajukeji and Mangalapayam, along with other parts of central Ikatora state. Kajukeji Commissioner Panuel Dumo says at least 21 people were killed and two others were injured when suspected armed Dinka boar cattle keepers from Jongle State's boar county were grazing the animals in Kajukeji, attacked a number of villages. He said the herders savagely murdered unarmed civilians after unknown assailants assaulted their camps hours earlier, killing six herders and 48 animals. Archbishop of Canterbury Justin Welbe, who accompanied the Pope to South Sudan, tweeted Thursday he was horrified by Kojokeji County attack on the heap of the religious leaders' pilgrimage to Juba. It is a story too often heard across South Sudan, Welbe added. Two weeks ago, gunmen killed more than 20 head of cattle reportedly belonging to the Boer community. Fighting between herders and residents over grazing and farming has continued for decades. President Salva Kiir ordered cattle herders in the Egatora region to return to their place of origin. For VOA News, I am Deng Gaideng in Juba. Liberia says it needs $1 billion from development partners to reduce carbon emissions, reserve its forests, and benefit communities living there. Liberia's President George Weir says he supports climate financing because the country is the major contributor to carbon dioxide emissions, in part by burning fossil fuels. The World Bank says proper forest management could reduce emissions and would help Liberia trade its carbon stock. The comments were made at a two-day Forest and Climate Resilience Forum that took place in Morovia over the weekend. Moses Gaziawu reports. I am the forest. With the presence of the forest, we have much of our carbon being absorbed, stored in wood, plant matters, and under the soil. That's a contestant in a pageant at the conference, one of the candidates who represents the forest, fossil fuels, plant or other elements of global warming, will be selected as a lead campaigner to work with the government on creating awareness on climate change. The meeting brought together key stakeholders in the climate and forest sectors representing the development and bilateral partners of Liberia. They were looking at ways to catalyze and renew commitments and strengthen partnership that sustain forest management to boost prosperity and help the poor. Liberia's President George Weir said the country has already started to take key steps to improve forest management and fight climate change. In recent years, Weir has supported the idea of an African carbon market as the basis for a concerted effort to address the problem. Weir said he remains firm on his call for climate financing for the country that he proposed at the last two UN conference of parties, COP26 and COP27. My government is currently creating new protected areas to expand our already existing protected area of network. The executive director of Liberia's Environmental Protection Agency, Wilson Tape, assured partners that Liberia will continue to protect its forests but needs financial support. In terms of our carbon stock, we are asking the international community to begin in the next several months ahead to think about creating a pool fund up to a billion dollars so we can be able to leverage our carbon stock. The forum provided a platform for high-level stakeholders to discuss key areas of progress, challenges, and the next step in the forest sector. 
World Bank Lee Environmental Specialist and Africa Climate Change Coordinator Dr. Kanta Kumari Regard said that Liberia has the capacity to improve its forest sector management. But she said there are key obligations the country must meet in order to raise revenue from its carbon stock. If Liberia reduces their emissions, which means that they do less deforestation and manage their forests better, that means they will be getting emission reductions, those can be traded with another party of the convention and then there will be payment for these emission reductions that they've done. Dr. Riga said the World Bank has developed an Africa climate business plan to shape development in smaller countries that are imparted by climate change, which actually affects their development goals. The first and foremost is food security. The second priority was was about ecosystem stability and water security. This is where your forests come in. The third is resilient urban cities. The fourth important area is energy access. And the last is about managing climatic shocks. Norway's special envoy on climate change and forests, Hans Braster, told the gallery, despite its effort, Liberia is not qualified for the funding it is seeking. Countries like Ethiopia, Ghana, Colombia, Costa Rica, Gabon, Indonesia are all now benefiting from such sources. So despite efforts made, we are not quite there yet in Liberia. Civil society groups in Liberia are seeking a transparent process to determine how climate finance policies are crafted. The chair of the National Civil Society Council, Loretta Poca, said despite legislations, many communities are still struggling to get remittances from existing programs. There are a lot of areas owed to the community in terms of land rental fees. Governments, they owe communities those money that they should receive as a benefit. So now you're talking about climate financing. What approach do you want to use so that those things cannot be repeated? Environmentalists say Liberia's forests, which serve as a sponge so Soaking up carbon dioxide have the potential to reduce extreme poverty with increased prosperity by introducing improved policies that also reduce carbon emission. However, the complaint that forests are threatened by continual degradation and clearance for agricultural expansion, illegal logging, and mining. For VOA News, I'm Moses Gazo in Monrovia. Italy has become the latest country to join the U.S. led mineral security partnership that promotes ethical mining. The U.S. Undersecretary of State for Economic Growth, Energy, and the Environment, Jose Fernandez, made the announcement while attending the African Mine in Daba or conference. Vicky Stark reports from Cape Town, South Africa. In his keynote address, Fernandez said members of the Mineral Security Partnership, which now include Italy, 11 other countries and the European Union, will soon announce details of their environmental, social and governance principles. He said the aim of the partnership announced in June last year was to add ethical values to the entire critical minerals and batteries value chain. We want to involve the communities affected by potential projects in the decision-making process. And if you were to say that we're doing this to protect our bottom line, you'd be partly right. We've seen too many instances around the world, some going on right now in South America, where community oppositions has led to the closure of otherwise profitable mines. But Fernandez says the MSP also wants to protect the environment. He said in their meetings with potential partners, it's been clear that many companies want to do the right thing for the planet. They won't make investments in projects that destroy precious rainforest, that are not committed to the remediation of mines, that require payoffs to government officials. They just won't do it. Their shareholders won't allow it. Their customers will reject them and our laws will punish such conduct. Fernandez says that's why many companies have joined the United States Public-Private Alliance on Responsible Minerals Trading. We see some companies, companies such as Tesla, going into the mining business for nickel. To ensure the stability and transparency of, of their supply chains, General Motors has made public commitments to sustainable sourcing. Ford and other car makers have also made similar promises. He said since beginning its work less than a year ago, the MSP has looked at 200 projects and chosen 12 to work on. He gave some examples of their work. Two East Asian countries are creating a critical minerals and metals cooperation center where one country will share technical expertise with the other. In the Pacific region, minerals production is booming and a couple of our partners are working together to develop battery materials and will work to attract transparency 
transparent investment and trade in the Pacific. Fernandez said that ethical conduct in this sector is critical as the world races to make an energy transition to stop rapid global warming. Meanwhile, in his opening address at the event, South Africa's Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy, Gwede Mantashe, stressed that South Africa is trying to end a long-running problem of frequent power outages. Daily power cuts have impacted mining production. It also impacts on the mood in the country. That's why, as a Department of Mineral Resources and Energy, we've put four points that we think need attention if we are going to overcome load trading within the next 12 months. And this will give us space to work on long-term energy security for the country. The investing in African mining in Daba ends on Thursday. Vicky Stark for VOA News, Cape Town, South Africa. At least 3,400 people have died so far from a magnitude 7.8 earthquake that struck southern Turkey and northwest Syria early Monday. It was followed by a series of powerful aftershocks hours later. The death toll is likely to rise as rescuers continue to dig through thousands of crushed buildings. The quake occurred in an area already reeling from war, an economic crisis, and a gathering spot for millions of Syrian refugees. Oban Koban is the government relations and security advisor for Save the Children in Istanbul, Turkey. He tells viewers Caravan Dam that Monday's earthquake was so far the worst in the last 100 years in Turkey. In total, more than 5,000 buildings have collapsed. And the ones that could have been accessed, the uh, deputy and security teams are providing services. Rescue operations going on, but some big majority of them, we currently see that there's a problem in having good numbers of service staff trying to, you know, rescue the people. So uh, we, we expect the numbers to go up. Are your people there too, also trying yeah. to get people out of those crushed buildings? We are right now operating under the, you know, uh, guardianship and coordination of the Director General for Disaster Management. And we are actually being told what to do, how to fill in the gaps. At the moment, what we are trying to do is we are trying to access the area because it's almost impossible there are no flights, airports have been damaged, some other military airports are only being used for um, humanitarian aid services. So we are right now trying to reach and find out what the initial needs are and accordingly uh, we'll be coming up with a response structure. Can you describe this area of Turkey? This is the southern part of Turkey, um, yeah. but also in that part, isn't Turkey hosting millions of Syrian yeah. refugees? Yeah, in total, almost 4 million Syrian Syrians under temporary protection are currently residing in the country, and some good numbers of Syrians are living in some of those cities. This is exactly the, the, the place where uh, almost up to a million of them are, are residing in. I've seen yeah. some of the video, and it, it looks devastating, but can you just describe a little of what is going on in that in that part of Turkey right now? What yeah. what what is being done? Okay, um, in the midnight, twelve past zero four zero zero, at a magnitude seven point nine in the U.S. scale, uh, earthquake has hit ten cities at the same time. Turkey had to elevate its alert level to four, which means all the sources and personnel from all of the governor rates have been flushed into those impacted areas. Plus, international support was requested from international you know, allies and from, from different countries. Rescue operations teams from the United States, Azerbaijan, Iran, Israel have already come to the country. Russia said they are sending people. Uh, EU humanitarian mechanism have been activated. They are also sending out. So at that part of the country, unfortunately, there are two sides at the moment. At one side, the services and teams have reached out to the collapsed buildings trying to get out the people. But also in the rural areas, especially in, in governorates and cities like Hatay, Osmania, and Adayaman. In the rural sites, there are areas, massively impacted areas, which have not been truly accessed yet. So in those areas, unfortunately, there are various hundreds of buildings actually currently collapsed and potentially having people underneath them waiting to be rescued. That was Oban Koban, Government Relations and Security Advisor for Save the Children.